Now, you mentioned Mad Magazine, Sergio Argonis and Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, Mad Magazine has come up a, a few times on this podcast. Uh, people frequently cited as an influence. And you yourself, um, you yourself have done some work for Mad Magazine. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, besides what you just mentioned about the um, the way they blended politics and satire, uh, what what specifically drew you to to Mad uh, first as a reader and later as a collaborator? Well, I mean, probably one of the first things, ironically, is Spy versus Spy, because you, you, know, you kind of read it before you've even noticed because there's no words. And so I just puzzling out what uh, Antonio Prochias was doing with that and the really graphic way he did it um, was, was really um, um, grabbed my attention and probably got me on a road where I was really interested in wordless comics. Um, Sergio Argonis was the same thing because he did a lot of, I mean, his marginals were wordless and then he did these books, The Shadow Knows and a number of th things that were, um, that didn't have any words. And I, I love the paperbacks of those that I would like flip through in my local drugstore that happened to carry mad books, like in a corner. Uh, but, um, you know, the humor and the idea that adults were making fun of these serious institutions and doing it with with uh, cartooning and that they were, you know, taking songs and doing parodies of them just wigged me out because it was, um, and especially with the extra opportunity to see the artists in person and see that they love what they were doing. Um, I mean, Sergio Argonis would come to a New York comic convention. There'd be a chalk chalkboard there and he would draw for an hour, the whole scene of the, um, of the convention. And, you know, he did that uh, just because he was interested in doing it and having fun with it. And that that didn't, you know, so the, that there here was people who had grown up and they had jobs that were clearly play. And um, but also making fun of the political figures at the time, like Richard Nixon. This was my my like earliest sense of like, wow, you can do that. And um, I like political editorial cartooning as well. So there were lots of uh, cartoonists like Herblock and uh, Doonesbury was there and, and uh, in, the, in the paper and, um, you know, just the, the, the daily uh, editorial cartoons. And so all of that was colliding um, as, as part of my um, general education in this form. Now, besides cartoonists and comic book artists, your work seems to draw a lot from graffiti art and street art. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Uh, can you tell me the appeal of that and uh, how um, how you decided to to implement that style into your comic book work? Well, I I moved to New York in 1977, and at the time when I first arrived, there was a garbage strike, uh, two week garbage strike, so there were rats everywhere place smelled to high heaven it was summer. Uh, there was uh, Son of Sam was running around uh, shooting people. This is an old, old you can see movies about this. Uh, and um, then there was a blackout um, about a month after I arrived and uh, it was like a riot in the streets. And um, I just was like, I'm in heaven. This is fantastic, how exciting. It felt like the movie Shaft or Taxi Driver. And I, I had a uh, had visited New York year after year for comic conventions. So I was familiar with New York. And so it had this exciting appeal to me, but it was also um, the grittiness of it was, was scary. And it gave me a great respect um, for, for going into it. Like I knew that this wasn't like, you know, playtime to be in New York. You had to look over your shoulder and be careful which block you walked on. But there was also a lot of art on the street. There was just this evidence of people just doing it like Keith Haring was drawing in the subways. And so you, you know, and that was just like free art for the public. And so, you know, there was this black paper that was put up over advertisements before they prepared for the next ad. Keith Haring looked at that and said, hey, I think I'll do some chalk drawings on there. And then, then we saw that kind of move out into the fine arts world, which was re remarkable. And he was doing murals around town. There was also a lot of the, the protest to what was going on and, and now I was, I moved to New York when I was 18, I was getting more politically aware and, and more politically frightened 
with um, Ronald Reagan heading towards office, the idea that um, you know we we literally might have a third world war, um, that we, we we were there was the Cold War with Russia, and that was getting ramped up with um, you know warmongers like like uh, Ronald Reagan uh, coming around. So there were a lot of people doing re reacting with protest imagery that was sprayed on a wall. Uh, there were these shadows sprayed on the wall that were painted on the wall that represented the shadow that is left behind after a nuclear blast where the, the person is vaporized, but where their shadow was, it, it casts on the wall and um, things like that, which were, um, you know, the, you'd see these around and people were putting up posters, but then first rain, they would disappear. And, and it was very inspiring to see that. And many things that stuck around were done with stencils and spray paint. 